We are continuing our series, The Intentional Life, and the whole premise of this series, right, is that we um, need, we want to move from kind of good intentions uh, to intentionality, especially when it comes to our spiritual life uh, and in our walk with Jesus. And so last week we talked about stopping. Um, how, how many people did a great job stopping last week? Good, good. Um, we, and, uh, and that's just something that we got to practice, continue to practice, because we have built our whole lives surrounding this idea of go, 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 right? And so it's going to take some work to begin to put into practice what we're talking about. And like we always say around here, right, the difference between a good intentions and intentionality is a plan, as a plan. And so um, if you're still, if this week was rough on this, in the stopping area, um, Man, that's not just a once, one, do it for one week when we preach about it and then don't do it. This is practices that we need to continue on and practice in our everyday, every week life. Today we're going to talk about prayer as a part of the, our, our growth in our relationship with God. Um, prayer is important. I don't think there's any arguments, right? In fact, when we talk about prayer, um, if, if, if I say, hey, we need to pray, and, and you ought to pray, everybody who is a believer in Jesus says, yeah, I know, right? So I, said, I, should, I could stand up here and say, you ought to pray, have a good day, right? And we could be done because we all know that we need to pray. Um, but sometimes, if you're like me, that there's a disconnect somewhere. And what I find, it, like, I know I should be praying more, and, and I, I probably... Um, I need to add some intentionality in that, but how? Like sometimes we just kind of miss it. So we're going to spend this morning kind of coming around this idea of prayer. And what gives me a lot of hope, what gives me a lot of security and, and a lot of like, hey, maybe I'm not, um, I'm not alone in this, is that um, the passage we're going to look at today is the disciples, they come to Jesus. And, and one day they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. Right? Now, these are 12 Jewish boys who grew up knowing how to pray. They were taught from a very young age. These weren't like, these weren't like people who had never had any religion in their life, never known God, never. And, and they're like, we don't really know how to do this prayer thing. These were 12 boys who grew up praying the, the prayers, the religious prayers that they were supposed to pray, uh, knowing how, knowing that prayer was important in their life. And yet, when Jesus prayed, these Jewish boys looked at Jesus or, or they, they heard the way Jesus prayed and they said, I don't think I'm doing this right, right? I, I don't think, because I, I hear what Jesus is saying and I, I see how Jesus is praying and I know how we pray. Maybe I'm not doing it right. Now, that's a little weird realization to come to. I'm sure for them it was a weird realization for them to come to, that maybe they just, they, they were missing something in their prayer life. They'd grown up doing it, maybe like me and maybe like you, you've prayed before, you, you've grown up prayed, but have you, ever, have you ever come to the realization that when it comes to prayer, maybe you don't have it all figured out? Or, or, or maybe, have you ever felt like when you're praying, you're like, I just don't know if this thing, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Because I hear about other people, I hear about other Christians talking about prayer and how awesome it is, and then I try to pray, and I don't get it. Maybe I'm not doing it right. Now, that's a little weird if, if I was to come to you, if somebody was to come to you. Could, like, could you imagine if you prayed, right? And you like stepped out and you prayed out loud at, at a group, maybe it was your discipleship group, or maybe it was in a group setting and you prayed and, and somebody came up to you and like, yeah, you didn't, you didn't really do that. Great, right? That would be a little offensive, right? Like, wait a second, I thought I was just talking to God. Right? I didn't know there was a way to or not to pray. And yet Jesus, when he prayed, the disciples, these religious Jewish boys said, maybe I'm not doing it right. And so today we're going to talk about prayer and how Jesus prayed. And his, 
and, and the method in which, now, what we've got to be careful is this. When it comes to prayer in Scripture, there's a lot of different types of prayer. There's a lot of different um, examples of prayer. So today we're going to talk about how Jesus prayed. In a very well-known passage of Scripture, the Lord's Prayer, that I'm sure that you've read, maybe you have memorized, maybe you grew up, if you grew up in certain religious uh, traditions, you've you said that pretty regularly. Today we're going to look in Matthew chapter 6 at what Jesus says, um, Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 through 13. If you are here, you can grab out your sermon notes out of your bulletin or open up on the app. If you're joining us from home, the sermon notes are on the app if you want to open that and follow along with us as well. Because I think that um, although there's a lot of different methods to pray, um, and there's not there's, there's um, a lot of right ways to pray. Today, we're going to f- focus in and narrow in on the Jesus way to pray, the way Jesus prayed when he was on earth. And what I want to help us understand is that this is not a formula. This is not just a little, um, this is not just like a, a say it rotely and it will work. This is a uh, example that Jesus gives us. Because I don't know if your, your prayers consist of this or not, but for large stretches of my life, I treated God like he was like the person on the other end of the drive through window, right? And the, you know how fast food works. We drive up, we pull up to a little speaker, we submit our order, we drive up to the first window, and then we get our food, right? Or maybe we drive to the first window, pay, and then we go to the second window and get our food. They, they added a whole step in there. But you get my idea, right? And so sometimes we're thrown off when, when in prayer, if we treat, are treating God that way and we're like, God, I, I submitted my order. I pulled up to the second window. Where's my results, right? And, and Jesus is going to say in this, that's not what prayer is necessarily about. So let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5 says, and when you pray, Jesus starts off right here under the assumption that we all pray, right? He's saying, and when you pray, it's not if you pray, it's when you pray. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now, nobody really does this in our culture anymore, right? And if they do, we're all like, that person's weird, right? Nobody stands on the street corners next to the church building and says their prayers out loud just so that everybody can think, man, they're so spiritual, right? In fact, that doesn't, that, like everybody would be like, they would think something about them, but not they're super spiritual. They think they'd be on something, right? So we don't have this in our culture necessarily, but it, in their culture, it wasn't uncommon for the holy pe- for, for religious people and people who thought of themselves to be holy to stand outside on the street corners and to, to pray loud prayers just so people could be like, wow, I hope one day I can attain to that level of holiness, right? And today there's a cultural disconnect for us, but what Jesus says is don't do that. Don't do that. And he says, truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And Jesus enters in this idea that we're going to come back to in a little bit, that there is a reward in prayer. When you are praying the way Jesus instructs us to pray, that there's a reward in prayer. And then he launches into it. Um, he launches into his, his dialogue on prayer. Now, most of us pray at different times, right? We pray uh, on the road. We pray um, when we're in our discipleship groups. We pray uh, while we're before a test or during work time or before meals, right? And that, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think we should pray. If there's a, 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 a choice between not praying in a situation and praying in a situation, we should go with praying in the situation, right? That we should be praying at all times. But Jesus enters this idea that there's another way that we ought to be praying. And he, he says it like this. But when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. And so what Jesus is saying is that there's times in your life, and there should be often in your life, we see this in the life of Jesus, where he says, yeah, it's great to pray on the go. It's you, great to pray before tests. It's great to pray while you're driving. All that's great. 
But there's also a time where you should be alone, where you should get alone with the Father. And this is so cool. He says, you should go away by yourself, go into your room, close the door. In other words, be by yourself and pray to your Father who is who is unseen. And then he says something so cool. He says, then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. So when you get alone and you pray to your father who is unseen, the God of the universe sees you. He sees you when you are praying. And there he says again, he says he will reward you. He rewards you. And you're saying, well, um, I'm not really praying to get a reward. It doesn't matter. When God says he's going to reward you, he's going to reward you. When you pray, the, the natural byproduct of prayer, Jesus enters in this idea that God will reward you. Now, does that mean Jesus is going to give us everything we ask for? I think we've been walking with the Lord long enough, right, to know that's not how it works, right? I, I think we know, even if we haven't been walking with the Lord a long time, that the reward isn't that he's going to give us everything we ask for. Otherwise, your first car would have been a BMW, right? You would have, you know, you would have been the star athlete in your school, if that's the case, right? Your career path may have looked completely different, right? You, you, you wouldn't have had any health problems, and there would be people who are, who, are not, who are not with us anymore who would still be with us, right? If God the reward was that everything you prayed for, you got. We know that's not how it works. We know that's not what the reward is. The reward is actually much, much better than that. Man, how could it be better than God giving me what I want? We don't really want that. And Jesus goes on to show us why. He says, continues on, and when you pray, again, He's like assuming you are praying, right? And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for, and this is huge. Here's what he's getting at. The pagans in that day, uh, they thought, uh, the people in that day, and Jesus calls them pagans. He didn't, I didn't call them pagans. Jesus called them pagans, right? He's like, listen, these people, they think that if they keep asking, 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 and just can't keep going over and 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 over again, that, that that's the solution to get Jesus to do everything that we ask him to do. Right? That we try to, that, that with our constant asking, that we can somehow bend God's will to line up with our will. Now, this is where prayer, teaching about prayer on one Sunday within a series is hard, right? It's difficult because we have illustrations otherwhere in scripture that we ought to be persistent in prayer, that we ought to keep praying, that we ought to keep coming to God in prayer, right? So which is it, right? Are we not to be like Jesus says here, don't keep babbling on like the pagans, or are we to be persistent like the persistent widow in his parable, which is it, right? And I, more than, more than is it this or is it this? I think it has to do with our heart in the matter. Right? More than whether we should con continually pray and ask God for things or ask him once and, you know, shut up after that. Right? It's more of where our heart lies in it. Are we asking God over and over and over so that we can bend God towards our will? Are, are we trying to move God towards what we want by continually begging? And here's the issue I have with that. I don't really think we want a God that's going to bend to us. Because if God bends to us in our wisdom, how wise is God? Right? How, so, we, I, I don't really want a God I can convince 
that my way is better than his way. So here's what he says. He says, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. <laughs> your father knows what you need before him. Ask him. You don't have to be louder than everybody else. You don't have to beg. You don't have to be long. You need to go over and over and over. Why? Because Jesus it says he already knows. God already knows what we need. And, and we'll add to that what he we want before we even ask him. So here's the question I have that maybe you have too. Then why pray? Right? If God already knows, and I, I've, I've thought this before, right? Well, if God already knows, right? Then why am I talking to him? Why am I praying? Why, why, why do this whole thing? If, if prayer is not about convincing God, if it's not about um, informing God um, to, and, and faith in God into doing what we want, then, then what's it about? And I think that this is what the disciples, when they heard Jesus pray, I think this is the distinction that they were picking out. They were like, Jesus is doing this differently than we were taught than we grew up doing. There's something different about the way Jesus is praying because he's not there saying, hey, 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 God, hey, 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 just, hey, just want to make, you, make sure you know, keep it, you know, just want to make sure you keep it in front of you. It's like as though we, sometimes we're treating God like um, our request was filled out on a piece of paper and it got moved to the bottom of the pile and we just need to keep making sure that that paper is on the top of the file, Right? And it kind of sounds silly when we put it to words like that, but sometimes that's how we, we just kind of keep putting it up there. So if that's where you're at, I've got... What, what, what's great news is Jesus is like, here, I'll show you how to pray. And he says, starts it in verse 9. This then is how you should pray. This is the way that Jesus prayed. This is the way that when he was on earth. Now again, I, I want to... I want to warn us, this isn't a formula, right? If you say these, it's not a magic spell, right? That if you say these certain words in this certain order, that it will somehow unlock something. What Jesus does is he gives us a, a, a method. Jesus gives us uh, more than exact words. Um, he gives us uh, a, a path. And again, if you grew up in some religious systems, Catholic, we, they, they said this prayer as though it was, had magical power to it, um, that it somehow unlocked some superstitious things. It's not superstition. Um, this is how Jesus says you should pray. Remember this. Um, first thing we should do is declare God's greatness. In our prayer times, we declare, we should start off by declaring God's greatness. This is how Jesus started off his prayer in verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's very different than, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Now that we got that out of the way, let's get on to me. Right? Um, he's saying, Father, such an intimate word. He, and we know that because of what Jesus did on the cross, we are able to come before the throne of grace. We are able to call him Father. We are able to relate to God on the basis of, uh, of family relationship, right? Our Father in heaven. Heaven, this place that's so far away. Even in saying that, we're declaring, we're reminding ourselves that our Father, he is in heaven. He, is, he, is, he has created the heavens and the earth. And then it says hallowed. And that word hallowed means big, majestic, holy, other than set apart. In other words, what we're doing in this, when we're declaring the greatness of God, uh, God's greatness, we are reminding ourselves that the person that we are addressing is so far larger and bigger than our minds could ever imagine. That we are blowing the, our, our perspective of God up in our minds. He is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of you and I. And this God who is so big and so far away has invited us to call him Father. Wow. Even in that first line, that should just kind of blow us away. That should just kind of make us pause, right? In our prayer time, our Father in heaven, man, you're, you are so much better bigger and holy and majestic and, and other than me. Wow. 
if we were going to address a dignitary or a person, like a president or a high-ranking person, the protocol uh, for how you address them, right, is, is, is important, right? When, when we're addressing somebody that's um, above us in, in, in uh, like, in our workplace, like, in, in our society, right? We address some, we know how to address people with honor. When we were kids, right? That's why we called um, our teachers, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so or ma'am or, or sir, right? We, we understand that because we understand that there's a protocol for addressing people in authority over us. And God says this, this is what's awesome. Jesus says the protocol for addressing God is this for you and I, Father. We need to call him Father the God of the universe. Here's the thing. I'm convinced that the longer we can stay here, the longer that we can stay in declaring God's greatness, the less time we are going to spend on our needs, on the things that are stressing our lives out. And the quicker we rush through this, the more overwhelming the things that we're going to pray about are going to become. Our Father in heaven, he's big, massive God. He's got it all. And by by the way, he already knows what you're going to talk to him about. That should bring us comfort. We're not going to surprise him, right? We got, we, you, man, say you're something stressed out in life. There's some big, overwhelming things in front of you that, that you don't know how to handle and it's causing stress and anxiety and worry in your life or it's causing depression in your life or it's causing uh, all sorts of angst within you in your life. And you come to God and you say, our, our God, and, and you tell him what it is. He's not going to be like, whoa, I didn't know that. Huh. Wow, that sucks. Right? That, that's not what God, he's like, yeah, I, I, I see you. And I know you. And so when we can blow our image of God up in our minds that he is the holy one, he is the the righteous one, and we we pause to think about who we're talking to, I think think that helps us in the rest of our prayer. Because we understand that the one we're talking to actually has the authority to get something done. Then he gets to the part that I'm convinced we need to spend longer with. He said, this is how you should pray. The second thing you can write in, surrender your will. Surrender your will. He says this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't need to just pause here. I think we need to slam the brakes on here. Jesus is saying, before we get to you, we first need to surrender to him. Because you have a kingdom, and I have a kingdom, right? And when things are upsetting in my kingdom, and my guess is that when they're upsetting in your kingdom, that's all that matters to you and me, right? God, my kingdom is in trouble, right? I've got this that's threatening my kingdom. The enemies of my kingdom are at my gates and I'm a little concerned, Lord. And and I'd love to just talk about my kingdom for a moment because people need to realize that I have a kingdom and I am the king, or for you ladies, I am the queen of this kingdom and everybody else needs to understand that, right? And if everybody would come in line and understand that I am the king or the queen of this kingdom and they would do what I want, including you, God, then everything would be okay because I am the king or I am the queen. Right? And maybe we don't say it in those words, but often that's how we pray. God, help me, help, help, help people around me see things the way I see things because clearly my way is right. And if they would just come around and see things my way, then everything would be going much more smoothly in our home, in our workplace, with our relationships. And oftentimes, 
we do fail to recognize that it's not really about our kingdom. And that God loves us. And he, he's our father in heaven. He cares so deeply for us. And he cares enough for us to not let our kingdom be the most important kingdom in the world. Because he is the king who reigns supreme over all. And we need to pause here and say, God, I recognize that I really want this. But your kingdom matters more. Your will matters more than mine. You can write this in. The purpose of prayer is to surrender our will, not impose it. Man, that's hard sometimes because I really want to impose my will sometimes. And I'm a person who tends to think that, or who always has a plan, and I tend to think my plan's the best plan. That's just who I am. I have to always work off of the, work, work off of the place that says my plan's the best plan, right? And sometimes when I come to God, I, I think my plan's the best plan. And I say, God, if you could just get, get behind my plan, then I think the world would frankly be a better place. <laughs> and God must just laugh. And here's the deal with prayer and what Jesus, I think, is doing when he says these words, your kingdom come, your will be done. He's not trying to impose even his will. He's surrendering it. We spend so much time trying to impose our will onto God to convince him. And what prayer is about is bending our will to line up with God's will, not trying to bend God's will to line up with my will. And the faster we can figure that out, the faster we can kind of live there, surrender there, the better off we will be. What's interesting, this whole thy kingdom come, thy will be done thing, that should, be, that, that should determine how long we should pray. Pray long enough, talk to God long enough, declare God's greatness long enough, surrender your will long enough till, where you, till you get to the point where you can align and bend your will and surrender it to him. What's interesting <laughs> to me, Jesus had to do this too. How long did Jesus have to pray to raise Lazarus from the dead? Like 20 seconds. Lazarus, come on. Lazarus comes walking out. It was like 20 seconds, right? He said, God, I pray that you'd be glorified in this. Lazarus, come on out, right? How long did Jesus pray before he surrendered his life on the cross? All night. And what was that prayer consisting of? God, I don't want to do this. Father, I don't, I don't want to do this. but your will is more important than my will. The length of our prayer should, determine, should be determined by how long, it's, we, it, how long it takes for us to say with all of our hearts, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Even if I hate it, even if it doesn't make sense, even if I don't want to do that, even if it costs me, even if it, I, I'm not here, Lord, to bend my will towards you, I'm here to bend my life towards your will. And in, until we can get to that spot, I don't know if Jesus would say it's worth continuing praying. Because this is the purpose of prayer. Could you imagine what our world would be like if every Christian got alone every morning and prayed, our Father, your will be done in my kingdom. And there's a lot of things I want to talk to you about. But before we get there, I just want to let you know that whatever it is that you say to me, the answer is yes. However it is, wherever you want me to go, whoever you want me to talk to, however you want me to treat these people, the answer is yes. Because your wills are more important. You imagine what would happen in our world. But then God knows us and he... he gets 
So in his prayer, Jesus gets to the part that we normally get to quickest, right? Give us, give us. And that is acknowledging our dependence. You can write that in. Acknowledge our dependence. And here's what Jesus says. When you get to the part where you're asking God and acknowledging our dependence upon God and, and, and asking for things of God, um, here's the things that he's, Jesus says we should talk to God about. Provision, right? Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. And this for, Jesus, for Jewish people would remind them of manna, right? Where Jesus provided, Jesus, God gave them their daily bread every day. And so even in this, right, give us our daily bread. It's a reminder of God's faithfulness and his goodness and what he's done for us and the, the provision he's already given us and that we can, so we, can um, ne- so we never forget where our provisions come from. Every time you walk into your house, right, you're reminded that God has given us this place. I don't know about you, but my prayer last night at our dinner table consisted a whole lot of thanking God for that warm place to be on a very cold night. I thank God for our fireplace that kept, you know, our wood stove that kept kicking out heat all day long for us so that we could stay warm. That our power had stayed on. That's what I talked to God about. Reminding him and reminding our family more than reminding God, but reminding our family that we have so much to be thankful for because God gave us today our daily bread. Man, I saw that last night. And, and, and then I just got to be honest, guys, this morning. So that would happen. And then this morning I get up and I go, to, this, is, this is fresh and, and raw, right? I get on, turn on my, um, my, I turn on my shower, to shower before this, no hot water, Right? And I go around and flip every, every one of our faucets to hot water and nuts coming out, right? So like right now, even as I preach, and, and this is like this, so this threw me off this whole morning, right? Because all before I knew how to get here, but before I even got here, I was like under my house, making sure there's not water spilling out everywhere because of frozen pipes. I, I, I'm like, as we're here this morning, my mind's kind of like, okay, what do I got to do when I get home? My prayers, even as I knew I was preaching about this, today. I'm like, this morning, I'm like, God, just make it work. I need you to make it work. Make my hot water. Come on. We got I got, don't you know, I got things to do for you today, Lord. Right. And that was my prayer this morning. And it was like, Oh man, I got here. I'm like, Oh, I still got, I got to surrender. I got to surrender my well. And then I got to go fix a hot water line somewhere in my house. Um, so if anyone will come on over this afternoon and help me crawling around my house, you're welcome. Um, But that doesn't stop me from saying, God, I'm so thankful for a place that I even have hot water. And when that comes on, I'm gonna be so thankful, right? God gives us provision. The second thing we can talk to God about is pardon. You can write that in. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts. This is recognition that even though we have surrendered our will, we have still sinned. We still are people who need forgiveness, pardon from the Lord. And as we need pardon, we need to, as as we receive forgiveness from the Lord, it's a reminder that we should be extending that forgiveness to other people. That we should be extending that same pardon that God has given us to those in our lives who have hurt us wrongness. And for some of us, that's going to force us to pray a little bit longer because there's some people in our lives that in our prayer life, we ought to be talking to God about and not talking to God that they're such a bum that they need to like fix them, but more so, God, I I just want to release, I, I need to forgive this person. And I may not be able to do it to their face right now because the opportunity might not arise, but I just want to talk to you about this, Lord, and I just want to forgive these people with you because I recognize, God, that you have forgiven me. Every day we pray, we're reminded that we need pardon and that we also need to extend it to others. And the th- third thing that Jesus talks about is protection. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. You know what this means? He's saying when you're praying, you're not intending to do evil. 
that when you're praying, you're praying with honesty, saying, God, I need your help. In these areas of my life where I'm weak, in these areas of life where I'm tempted, in these areas of life where I trip and stumble and fall, I need your help. I need you to come and guide me and lead me and give me self-control. Prayer is not a thing to do when we're planning on sinning. <laughs> That's not what God had in mind at all. There's some religions that, that went that way for a long period of time that people would pray before they sinned because they knew they were going to sin and they went and received penance so that they could go and sin. It's not the game that God had in mind at all. That's not what prayer is all for. Prayer is not for when you're planning on sinning. Prayer is when you're tired of sinning. When you know that, that sin and Satan is coming and he's, he, he continues to, to get you in this one particular area or in your life, and you're saying, God, I need your help. And I need you to walk me through this. And that's how Jesus prayed. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then most of us heard, grew up hearing that this, right? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a great ending to that prayer, right? The problem is, is it wasn't originally in the Greek. It was added later. That's why in some of your Bibles, it's not there. And you're like, wait a second. I, I've memorized this and that part's in there, right? And so then you look in your Bible and depending on what translation you read and you're like, it's not there. And then if you drop down the footnotes, it says um, that that was added later. Now here's the deal. It's a great ending to the prayer, right? In fact, some people later on, um, who are doing Bible translation or people who are actually, you know, uh, had the scrolls and they were looking at the scrolls. They're like, that's a great prayer, but it needs an ending. I mean, you can't pray without saying amen, right? How would everybody even know you're done, right? And so they added this ending. It's a great ending, right? There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing unbiblical about it. So it's fine. Just know it's not in the original manuscripts, but there's really no reason to freak out about that, right? So here's what Jesus is saying. Here's a big picture. He says, when you pray, you declare God's greatness. Surrender your will and acknowledge your dependence for provision, for pardon, and for protection. DSA. And you just remember that acronym, right? DSA. Here's what it doesn't stand for. Or here's what it stands for. Don't start off asking. That's what it stands for. Don't start off asking. Rather start declaring God's greatness, surrendering your will. And then you can get to the part where we start asking God. And I'm convinced the longer that we can stay in the first two, the shorter time we'll spend in the, in the asking space. So for our challenge for this week, and, and I know that as we talk right across the people in this room, the people who are online, right? I, I know that as many people who are listening to this we could, there's like this varying of how your prayer life is going. And some of you pray and, and you have a thriving prayer life. That's awesome. Keep it up, right? If you have a prayer life that's, that, that man, you are in the rhythm of and, and, and it's going well, awesome. Keep it up. But if you've been struggling, right, in prayer and you know, man, it's just one of, been one of those guilt things where you're like, I know I should be praying more, but ah, right? What we don't want you to hear today is guilt and shame. What we want you to hear today is great. Now you can start. And here's how you can start. You can start praying the way Jesus taught his disciples. These Jewish boys who heard Jesus pray and say, I don't think I'm doing it right. You can just jump right ahead into what Jesus says and start with praying the prayer that Jesus says. So here's the challenge card for this week. It's in your, it's in the backs. There's plenty of them in the seats, by the way, because we printed enough for everybody who's normally here, right? So you can take a bunch home, share them with your friends. Um, for those of you who are online, um, this will be, these will be posted online uh, this week. Choose a place and a time to pray this prayer. And, and 
And again, you can say these words, but remember exactly these words. This is not a magic formula. If you say these exact words, it's the heart Jesus was getting at. Declare his greatness. Our father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debtors. We also forgiven, uh, we have forgiven our debtors and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And just spend time each day. Let's do what Jesus did. Get alone and pray this. Declare his greatness. Surrender your will and acknowledge your dependence. That's how Jesus prayed. And you and I can do it. So that's the challenge for this week, right? Um, if, if you've been struggling in prayer, this is your challenge. You've been, if your prayer life's just clipping along just great and you have a great rhythm and you're great, just keep doing what you're doing. We want to encourage you with that.